Hello students, welcome to the lecture 2. In this lecture we will see in more details how does a BCI work. This is a continuation of the lecture 1 where we have had a, a B overview of the BCI um, systems or technology in general. So, we mentioned that Building a BCI is basically an engineering problem. And we briefly went through four essential components of the BCI systems. Generation, measurement, decoding, output, with the following flowchart connected. We had the human generating the brain data, the brain signals that corresponds to different mental state of this subhuman subject. Second part of the entire BCI system was the measurement systems, which could either collect brain activities in the form of magnetoencephalographic signals or electroencephalographic signals or functional fMRI. So in today's lecture we will uh, touch upon the details of generation and measurement techniques. So decoding will be the subject of the upcoming lecture and different output application. So let's again talk about the generation detail. So generation means <clears throat> get the person to produce a strong brain signal either by performing explicit mental task or through a normal mental process. We, we will see shortly that there are different experimental paradigms that are used to get the data or this, to get the strong signal from the brain. In the generation of the brain data, brain signals, there are some common mental tasks in practice. And we can divide those into experimental paradigms or experimental protocols called endogenous or exogenous. So endogenous depends on the experimental paradigm that doesn't depend on uh, external simulation. So uh, the subjects can generate brain signals independent of external stimuli. We also call them as uh, induced response. So it's internally induced response. Um, for this class of experimental paradigm, there are some tasks such as imagination of the limb movement or motor imagery, which we'll see shortly. So another type of the experimental paradigm used for mental um, task related brain signal generation is called exogenous. So ex in the exogenous case, uh, the, the difference is that this paradigm depends on the external stimuli, such as visual stimuli, auditory stimuli, or haptic stimuli. We also have um, defined this as evoked response. So the brain response externally evoked, while here it is induced response. So let's take a look at one of the examples of uh, endogenous uh, experimental paradigm. So in endogenous, we said the subjects can generate brain signals independent of external stimuli, and they are considered as an induced response. One of the earlier example of PCI, brain machine interface or brain computer interface, depended on so-called operant conditioning paradigm. 
So operant condition paradigm basically involves training the human to generate some specific patterns of the brain signal over some time. Those patterns are usually called uh, slow cortical potentials. So they are slow waves coming from the brain or cortex. Potentials means the signals. And can be recorded at central um, scalp position. Right. So that means you, you can try to control, regulate one part of the brain to generate specific um, slow signal, so slow cortical potentials. And it requires, however, a quite lengthy process. It's just like uh, learning a new skill. Right? It may take some time from three to six months, but eventually you will be able to, to control your brain to generate some specific patterns. And that can be picked up by uh, an electrode. In this uh, specific example, that the train is based on a similar paradigm called the neurofeedback. You will sit in front of a computer. This is the monitor, and you'll have your EEG or some brain data acquisition system attached to your brain, to your skull, non-invasively. And your task, your task will be to control this ball up and down. So the yellow ball uh, travels at a constant speed from left to right. And then your task is just to control up and down. You can do uh, any kind of different, you can try different mental imagination um, techniques. For instance, you can imagine um, kicking some some ball, squeezing something, any kind of imagination. Eventually, you'll be able to control this ball. This type of endogenous PCI can be used to control external applications, usually uh, in a binary command. However, this is a very classical early version of the brain machine brain computer interfaces that doesn't rely on any, on any uh, advanced sophisticated signal processing or machine learning algorithms. The, however, it involves a human to train he, himself. Okay, train himself is equivalent to establishing some kind of neuronal network on your brain or basically training your brain to generate some specific signal patterns or slow cortical potentials. Another example here I show is based on exogenous type of PCI, where human subjects are shown a grid of visual stimuli. And this stimuli is called a um, matrix speller. Uh, using this kind of uh, exa Genius PCI, we can develop PCI-based communication systems that allow people to type using their brain activities, right? So uh, this is called as brain computer interface based on event-related potentials. Here, user concentrates on one of the symbols that is being flashed usually in the in a pseudo randomized order so either rows or columns are intensified randomly so you focus pay attention or you attend at some letter for instance you want to type n right you look at it you pay attention to it and then you can generate brain response locked to that event event where this uh, column and row intensive is intensified. So that means again the target or column rows elicit or detectable event related potentials. And the task of BCI is to detect these 
event release potential. So they look like this. So for instance, you are looking at N, and then the brain response will look uh, as the following positive wave happening around 300 millisecond. In contrast, the non-target brain response will be of lower amplitude. And we usually visualize brain activities using so-called topographic maps that shows us the, the amplitude, the strength of the amplitude of the signal picked up by specific electrode. Here electrodes are denoted by the cross. This is your the nose of the human and the red represents the amplitude value increased or decreased. So we can see that brain response can be picked up uh, from the central locations of your uh, scalp. If we take a look at specific time series that has been acquired by EEG6 system, we can see um, interesting patterns of the brain. So here we're looking from the uh, top of the human scalp, nose, right ear, left ear, and we put sensors uh, denoted by the following letters, FC, F4, CZ, and some, some others. And then if you visualize Right, brain response is picked up by these sensors in the form of time series. We see some some interesting um, response. So, for instance, if we, in this case, if our goal is to spell out the letter N, we pay attention to the to this grid N, while others are also being simulated. And that N will have, and that during that moment, will have brain response with higher amplitude. And um, this allows a classifier to detect the presence of human brain response versus the background brain activity. We will see the details of how to get this brain response and how to analyze, how to extract in the coming lectures. However, the point here is that um, I want to show you that the deflection of target and non-target brain waveforms in the uh, raw form. Target response corresponds to the target stimuli we want to communicate, while non-target is any other uh, letters being flashed, but you're not interested, you're not paying attention to those characters or stimuli. What, a potential application of such ERP-based VCIs is to assist people with severe neurological diseases that are leaving them totally paralyzed, even being unable to communicate. And there has been a lot of progress, actually. So this lady has been uh, affected by so-called amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. So this is uh, the degenerative disorder that eventually makes a subject or person uh, totally locked in their body. So that means they can't even move their any muscles. They can't even speak. They can't even eventually at the late stage they can't unfortunately uh, move even their eyeballs. However, their brain is so healthy and intact and they can hear surroundings what's going on but they can never um, speak it out or provide any kind of output for communication um, and uh, Niels Beerbaumer is a very famous professor uh, from Germany University of Tübingen has been working in this area for decades and he has developed a lot of uh, applications applied on patients so patients are able to use those uh, VCI yeah, technology for communication. Right, this is one of his examples. So 
at, at our lab in uh, Nazarbayev University, we have also developed a non-invasive version of this uh, technology, I mean BCI for communication. As you can see here. And um, the target and non-target is uh, event is based on his intention, what he wants to communicate right now. So the columns and the rows of the visual stimuli generate specific brain signals. And then further we classify them into target and non-targets. So he's now trying to spell out um, in Kazakh language Nauros Kutovosan. And this type of PCI is pretty accurate and and possible to build with good accuracy. So these are the sensors, EEG sensors we see here, the amplifier and sample uh, real-time uh, brain data. So we are processing this data in real time and then uh, behind the scene and then providing these decisions. And the role of signal processing in the machine learning is very, very important in this case. So we will uh, see at some point later in the lab uh, how to perform this kind of experiment. All right, so if we can see, usually the, the accuracy is around 85% in, in our specific case and then the time required for spelling one character usually lasts like for, uh, for about five to six seconds. While it may look slow but this uh, intention, this character or spelling is coming directly from the brain. And then can be useful uh, for people who are uh, totally paralyzed or who are suffering uh, so-called uh, totally uh, locked-in syndrome problem. All right. So other example of the BCI. It's called motor imagery based BCI. Right now, the, uh, the task here is to move this uh, robot into several directions. Um, why I'm showing this is that this paradigm is different from the previously shown one. Different because the subject, the participant, has nothing in front of him in terms of no LCD, no monitor. Right, so he, this is uh, what makes it different, exogenous and endogenous. So he is now imagining of moving his left, right arms, and then also the foot movement. This is uh, one of the graduation work done by our students uh, a few years ago. And the entire framework is similar to what I have described. There's a bunch of sensors picking up the brain activity. In this case, we're recording data from uh, sensory motor cortex. The brain area responsible for motor uh, movement, like limb movement. Okay, and as you can see, it's quite slow, however doable. And also, let me show you another example. This is what we have seen. Uh, it's called a P300 speller. Belongs to one form of exogenous BCI, designed for communication. And here we have a very famous uh, so-called hexa speller which doesn't depend on external uh, stimulation. 
well here again uh, EEG cap recording brain data and then we have here some uh, visual feedback it's not stimulus he is imagining a motor imagination task moving his arms from binary we can map into multiple uh, letter or character uh, selection tasks so both uh, kind of systems have been developed and has been tested with real patients we also have PCI systems that use steady-state visual evoked potentials which belong to exogenous type of PCI so here uh, the difference of this PCI based on SSVEP, so it's called SSVEP, is that uh, we flash the characters of stimuli at some specific frequency. Right? So, for instance, um, so here we have 3 by 7 grid of stimuli, which can be replaced by characters. So each of these stimuli flash at different frequency so it is different it's not like column and row uh, intensification it is it is instead uh, flashing at some frequency so for instance you can flash this one at 20 hertz 16 hertz 17 or uh, 30 and uh, some slower range and then we can use a classifier to detect different patterns that has been generated by the brain and that correlates with the flashing of some uh, stimuli hmm? for instance uh, if you look at the lamp or stimuli being flashed at 16 hertz the you and you can record beta uh, data sorry from the human brain this is a, a, a picture of the brain simplified and get some uh, spectral information at that frequency band this is amazing and PCI based on steady, uh, steady um, state visual evoked potentials are one of the fastest PCI okay and then um, SSVEP based PCI can use visual, auditory, or tactile. So, tactile, so you can stimulate your um, skin, muscles, and then try to get the corresponding brain data. And then design some kind of uh, brain computer interface applications. Next, we have uh, sensor motor rhythm space. PCI systems, SMR stands for sensory motor rhythm. So the brain rhythm, the brain signal activity is coming from sensor motor cortex, which is uh, located around this area. So SMRs belong to endogenous type of PCI. So basically, the subject imagines a movement of right hand versus left hand. And by placing electrodes over sensor motor cortex around this area, and recording the data, we can classify into two classes. So we can decode uh, or discriminate left hand versus right hand, which allows us to build binary BCI systems. So anatomy or of these imaginations and the data will be explained later, but the task is that uh, now if you imagine, again, if you think or imagine of moving your limbs, left hand, right hand, versus also the foot movement, we can detect patterns in the brain data. And then uh, we yeah, develop a kind of application. So simply here, after pre-processing, so raw data, we perform some specific bandfast filtering, and then we detect uh, features. We also call them event-related desynchronization (ERD) or event-related synchronization. There are two phases. 
yeah we will also see again all of all the processing pipeline of uh, these data for building BCI in the in our experimental sessions the motor major BCIs have been used in different applications so th that range from controlling a wheelchair or robotic arms or as well as uh, controlling exoskeleton robots for uh, walking <coughs> in the early example I showed this uh, experimental setup which we have developed in our lab this is actually based on sensor motor resonance PCI so let me just uh, show you again so here subject thinks or imagines about moving his left right arm and then foot movement right so um, and then he can generate three comments so for instance here we have the following setting so plus means right hand movement imagination detected minus means left hand movement imagination detected and then this uh, uh, line or bar means a foot movement so by imagining foot we can move up and down this bar and then um, we can also design this kind of uh, user interface for for this kind of application open and close also all right so we use foot movement to up up down down and then each time um, minus plus which corresponds to left and right for moving into left and then right directions <coughs> so uh, finally there is uh, some another uh, interesting application of uh, exa uh, no endogenous VCI which is based on redness potentials so the redness potential represent the brain signal or brain response right before the onset of movement right so for instance in this example um, we have sensors connected to brain and the task is to control this upper limb exoskeleton and then the subject looks at this stimuli and the intends to move this robot up and down so he is not taking any visual stimuli he's just using it as a feedback visual feedback so he imagines he intends to move this robotic device and then the brain already generates comment so if you capture that those comments called redness potentials we can use them to decode brain activities uh, in real time all right so and again um, the redness potential location is different but mainly they are apparent in the sense motor and parietal cortex of the brain all right so just to summarize there are different ways to generate brain signals we have seen a couple of examples and demonstrations as well we classify them into exogenous and then into endogenous uh, type of uh, paradigm or the process to generate so exogenous depends on external stimuli whether this is a flashing something uh, to induce brain activities or to evoke sorry or exogenous or endogenous which comes internally so the the BCI and the, the entire framework doesn't depend on external stimuli stimuli stimulation so we have a subject like in this case not depending on any kind of external stimuli now let's move into um, reviewing some measurement technologies some measurement devices that allows us to acquire different types of the brain signals okay uh, such as EEG MEG fMRI then um, let's see the type of the devices can be classified as invasive and non-invasive or portable 
non-portable expenses versus chip so invasive usually involves uh, implanting electrodes inside the skull right uh, on top of the brain or deep inside the brain so invasive basically or op uh, involves open up, opening up the skull and then putting the sensors again on top of the brain directly so it requires surgery so in uh, in one of the video demonstration I showed uh, related to brain gate projects they implant um, these kind of sensors or uh, these kind of okay these kind of grid type of sensors this is the opening of the brain uh, skull this is the tissue on top of the brain um, these kind of experiments usually are done on patients who require some brain surgery such as uh, epileptic patients or with the agreement of the patients who wants to try this new technology and in contrast we have non-invasive these are the examples of the non-invasive technology so one of them is called uh, yeah, electroencephalography uh, in this case we call them electrocardiography so electrical uh, system uh, that records electrical activity of the brain from the cortex all right um, and we also have uh, some single cell recording and some other uh, details so EEG is one of the widely used uh, common portable um, modality that uh, we use for developing BCI or BMI technology and there is another portable one called near infrared spectroscopy so nears so while EEG records brain activities that correspond to neuronal um, uh, let's say firing at a low level so synchronization or uh, that corresponds to electrical activity of the brain uh, nears near infrared spectroscopy records uh, blood oxygenation or hemoglobin concentration in the brain vessels while well, we also have these systems you may have seen in the hospitals these are very big non-portable uh, MEG this is a magnetoencephalography um, example of this also records brain electric activity uh, functional res magnetic resonance imaging is another a bulky system that allows us to measure brain activities with very very good uh, spatial resolution again MEG records magnetic activities of the brain in this course we'll be mainly dealing with electroencephalography data EEG based uh, PCI BMI systems and sometimes we can also uh, work directly with the data that represents um, the brain the hemoglobin concentration levels um, and also we can also work on uh, electrocardiographic signals so if we if I open this slide um, these are only some of the limited examples of brain imaging modality we have some some other technologies and uh, if you compare them they have in terms of scales they have uh, different uh, characteristics like we are interested in two things mainly spatial and then temporal resolution so the spatial resolution uh, corresponds to how accurately or spatially how precisely you can visualize or record brain activities it's like the, the megapixel in your camera how uh, how much higher uh, megapixels you have the more better clarity you have or resolution so time means how or accurate or precise in time you can visualize acquire the brain data so we can see here for instance <coughs> the comparison between different technologies so EEG 
allows us to measure brain activities in the order of milliseconds. Okay, 10 to the minus 3. MEG also same. ECOG, so implanted electrodes, very fast. They can we can visualize brain activity in the order of milliseconds. While the spatial resolution of this EEG, MEG, and ECOG, well, is not that good. So we can see, uh, we can represent each as a blurred image of the brain activities, but we have much information about the time. Uh, and we can also see with uh, some technologies called computer tomography. They provide Okay, relatively better temporal resolutions while the spatial resolution is also good. So fMRI for instance, yeah it's good in terms of spatial resolution, right? So we're talking about four by uh, millimeters here, four by four and uh, some other F MRI for instance um, is quite slow. This is, look, this is um, one second, one millisecond. Here, this PET MRI say allow us to summarize brain activities around one minute. It's too slow. And SPECT is the slowest and was uh, the bad uh, spatial resolution. However, they can be used for other uh, application, clinical application, not for BCI. For BCI, what we are interested in is how fast, okay, how fast we can get the brain uh, response decoded. So some of them are EEG, MEG, and of course we would like to pinpoint spatially, right, where in the brain is that fast activity is happening. So MEG is one good candidate it has very good spatial resolution, some details you can see, and temporal and also non-invasive. However, it is bulky, non-portable. ECOG is very good candidate for developing BCI or BMI technology with a very fast, a good temporal and spatial resolution. However, it requires brain surgery, which may be very costly. So here we have another schematic overview of the recording techniques that can be used for the purpose of building brain-machine interfaces. So here this represents one single neuron, a bunch of neurons, and um, the, the brain activities. This is a gyrus, sulcus, a part of the brain, and the MEG. So SUA stands for single unit activity, MUA stands for multi unit activity. Single unit activity uh, involves recording brain activities from single neurons in the brain. Right? The scale of these recorded uh, neurons increases from left to right. right? But this again happens um, at the expense of spatial resolution right so here we have very good spatial resolution that temporal resolution uh, invasiveness of a method is another important issue especially if a BCI should be uh, operational over a, a long period of time on the left side um, the nerve cells are actually uh, attached to a piece with electrodes which have been inserted in the right into the brain. So we open the scalp and then put a single very tiny electrode. Well, while in, the, uh, in two cases, right? While ECOG, look, this is a great type of uh, electrodes, we call electrocardiograph, can record a brain activity overall on top of the uh, brain tissue, right? Inside the skull. 
so we're not recording this single cell recording which okay in this case also EEG finally records from the surface of the head and it's not invasive at all MEG as well so you can see um, in this figure one from single cell from neuron single neuron and size of neuronal clusters so brain cells up to uh, 100,000 uh, neurons so spatial resolution here we have very high spatial resolution because we can pinpoint exactly which neurons are firing where in the brain and yeah, by analyzing the data while in EEG case so one sensor picks up the activities of hundred thousand neurons so spatial resolution is very poor because we cannot tell among which one which group of these hundred thousand neurons are firing or working and also we have invasive versus non-invasive safety or long-term durability is another important factor in uh, developing BCI you see but uh, recent research especially uh, Elon Musk he's been working on developing his uh, company called Neuralink has been working on developing invasive BMI technology we will see that later uh, the specific case so in terms of the data set that equ is acquired in uh, different forms we can see here depths right depths corresponds to how deep we are inside the brain uh, log LFP stands for local field potential recordings uh, which correspond to the recording of some electrical current from the activity of a group of brain cells, brain uh, neurons within the small region of the brain while ECOG, electrocardiograph represents a recording of a, a large area of the surface of the uh, cerebral cortex of the brain okay and MEG, EEG, as I have already mentioned, this uh, MEG, scalp, MEG, uh, scalp EEG and MEG, recording of magnetic fields that are produced by electrical currents on these uh, electrical currents uh, from the surface of the scalp. And these signals come from hundreds of thousands of neurons and has to travel through the skull and several uh, layers of the skin before being recorded or picked up by single electrode as a result this several layers skull skin um, attenuates most useful information in EEG in, in, in this animation we see how we can relate the recorded uh, brain EEG signals these are a set of time series brain data acquired using electrocardiography can be represented or can be related to brain activation here you see the brain flashing brain uh, here one half of the one uh, half of the brain right side one hemisphere and um, left side of the brain so we can see as these amplitudes and then visually frequencies gets increased we see a flashing uh, widespread flashing or increased activities in the brain um, this data has been recorded from real epileptic patient um, and then we see that the first phase corresponds to normal uh, brain activity and then brain starts to, to
to move into super excited super uh, activated mode which corresponds to the, the epileptic uh, attack epileptic brain uh, start in other words i can also tell i can also um, assume that this is uh, the language of the brain that is encoded in this uh, kind of synchronous uh, time series data and our task in brain machine interfaces to decode right to decode this kind of data to translate them into external applications decoding mental state brings up the the topic of the next lecture and this one is the most important uh, component of the entire PCI system because given uh, this kind of data set we use signal processing or classification or decoding techniques in order to uh, decipher brain activity or mental state so being uh, uh, building a machine able to decode measurements to deduce user's mental state is uh, one of the crucial components that allows us to move into the, the final application which is the controlling of different um, let's say output devices computer cursor and many others so we will review different decoding techniques in general in the next lecture and then we will also move into uh, details of each method actually in the upcoming lectures so so far you can think about uh, these lectures as just general overview or introduction to the PCI or BMI technology if you have questions you can always uh, send me email or, or uh, drop uh, your questions in the telegram channel that you have created I will see you in the uh, next lecture then.